Welcome back, part two here. We'll be I'm joined tonight with Leon Price. I think it's been a great show, mate. It's great to have you Finally, here. finally been finally, joined. Finally, finally been joined. Eight years, eight years that <laughs> eight line. Eight years in the making. Eight years in the making and you've you've left me till now. And, and we, we knew each other outside of the game know, as well. I know, From when you were DJing and we know each other as friends, like paranoid, kind of friends. So I didn't want to, I just and wanted to I've never, I've never on. ever been invited onto this show. I'm feeding you paranoia. I'm really, paranoia. really disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> right, one man who was coming to Leeds and... Uh, is Sean Long and he's a really good mate of yours, a really good mate of mine. What do Leeds get with Sean Long? Tell right, us. Right, so I'd say over played professionally for a near on 20, 20 years. Yeah. And coming across the best of the best players, the best of the best coaches, what have you, the experience that that gives you. I'd say out of all of that, with between him, Daniel Anderson and Trent Robinson, are the three best rugby league brains that I've ever heard, ever seen, ever experienced in my life. And he's for me. He did as much coaching to me when I played for Saints as 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 Daniel Anderson did. Really, super, super, super smart. Knows more about the game than anybody I've ever met. Um, so intelligent, so so intelligent. I mean, I, honestly, he's, he's so switched on. You got Leeds have got a massive investment there, massive. And they've got some great kids coming through Leeds, and it, 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 it'll be really beneficial. And I'm, when I say kids, I'm talking about. You look at some of their scholarship and academy players, and there's some real talent there, some real <coughs> key players who I know that from going to watch them, because I'm sad and I like rugby, that there's some amazing talent coming through that club. And it, for him to get their hands on him at like 16, 17, yeah. 18 yeah, years old. They're going to learn, yeah, they're going to learn a lot. They're going to learn the, the subtleties of playing halfback, you know, learning how to engage line, learning how to play square, learning how to, you know, come off your inside, outside foot. Um, you know, just all the little subtleties that you need to learn that, unfortunately, for a lot of English players, there's not enough good coaches out there to teach you. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I, I played standoff and, you know, this is no disrespect to anybody whatsoever at all, but I played standoff and I were coached a lot of the times by people that have never played standoff or never played in the halfbacks and not really understood the position. They just simply don't, but, you know, somebody like Longy, they, they know the game inside out. You know, long when you play halfback, you've got to know every position what they do because you're the general on the field. You've got to know what the fullback does right through to lose forward from one to thirteen, yeah. and you've got to know how each position works and what they do, what they should do, and, and that's you, you know you're the brains of the team. So what the people, what the young people, Harry Newman and you know even Gailey and people like that, they'll be refreshed from it. And I've already heard that Longy were coming up to do one session a week from London with um, with Agar, because obviously they're good, good friends with Agar from Hull FC. Yeah. Um, and the, the, from what I've heard, the Leeds boys were absolutely loving it. Yeah. So go down there brilliantly. I think I agree with you. I think Sean Long at Leeds, it'd be great to see him, great to have him in our neck of the woods. And I think it'd be a great success. Since um, in my other role in life, uh, I work in diversity, as you know, and I've been helping the RFL and Super League with some of their diversity needs since George Floyd's been murdered, the rise of the Black Lives Matter campaign, the response to it, and from that, the subsequent, subsequent Tackle It campaign being launched. You've been right at the heart of those conversations, and you've been raised up by a, a number of the top players we currently have playing, like, see, Callum Watkins, Jermaine McGillivray, top black players in the sport, as a player, as a person, who they'd like to see more on TV. They, they were disgusted that you haven't been included more in opportunities post working in. And how did that make you feel when those guys are talking about you in, in with that reverence that, that raising your name up and being Jermaine McGillivray was disgusted at the fact you hadn't been in his eyes, treated fairly as a coach or as a player? Yeah, I think, um, if I'm honest, it gives you... Yeah. Just give me a minute. All right. Yeah. Give me a couple of minutes. Yeah, cool. It's just hard, isn't it? When it's so hard, mate. It's hard. People don't understand. I just feel like you get cast in a side and like booed out, and it's something you've um, you've done since you were eight, and you, you, there's no place for you. 
It's hard, really hard, really, really hard. It's horrible. Yeah. We haven't done this. It's hard. It's, hard. It? it's really, really hard. It's, it's, I get it. Cause... You, know, you, know, you know, I don't like talking about it because you want to, you want to move on with your life, and you still don't want to be like down. And I feel good, and I'm moving on with it. But then, like when you said that, then you're like, you like, you yeah, I mean, it takes, it takes a, like, you know, doing this work shone a light on the black community that had never been shone before. That a lot of people got the got a voice, and a lot of people. Were listened to, and a lot of people just said, "Well, actually, could we be better? You know, do we yeah. do enough? Mm -hmm. Our, especially in like, and I know we're the rugby league. A lot of people will talk about all lives matter. It's just like, you know, I got I got just down and end like yeah. trying to people on social media, but for every person who were negative, there were two who want, and two who got it, and two were like. So I saw how we're happy that, that that conversation were being had and that tackle it were being formed. But for me, it were about the players and talking to players and getting that conversation. And Jason Robinson spoke so passionately on a call with all yeah. captains of Super League. And like after that call, all captains of Super League were like, and they were literally the captains of Super League couple of members at RFL and June Ferris from Sky on that call, they were only people who heard his story. And it was just like, he could, it, it, it went on, it just went off on one for about 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And it was like, unbelievable. Like his passion and his, it just made it all make sense. It was like a Michael Holding moment, but right, okay. the world didn't see it, just the people, and all the captains in Super League saw it and it was like, wow, proper powerful. And it's like, I know how you've been feeling, and it's like, it, it's just not fair. There's, there's a lack of fairness there, and I'm glad you're getting some opportunities now, but it shouldn't have got to this for you to get those opportunities. Yeah, yeah but uh, it, it is where it is, Simone, I think, um, it's, for me, <laughs> I've done quite a lot of work with you over the last couple of months, and I think, it's a subject that I find really, really hard to talk about, but I'm glad we're having these discussions because it's long overdue. And yeah. <clears throat> what, what we must do is have these conversations so that we all understand where we, you know, where these issues come from, and so that it's easy for our children yeah. to 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 have a progression in in rugby, in TV, and whatever whatever job they have, and you know, more diversity, more equality, the, the better. So yeah, it's for me. I, I find it really, really hard to talk about because. I, something that was not much discussed. I think it was kind of like head down, ass up, yeah. you know, and just be tough enough to deal with whatever comes your way. But then when once your ability and once your, your, your playing days are gone, and then that, I think that's when you find how difficult it actually is. But as a sport, one thing I'll say is, as a sport, you've got to break a cycle. So you look back at Ellie Ranley, Martin Afire, Jason Robinson, You've got some blokes there have gone on to massively successful things, yet they haven't filtered into any position of power in sport in terms of on a board. So there's never been a black man on board at RFL. Mm. And I challenged Ralph for him on it when I spoke to him and we put it out on our show. And he said, yeah, probably needs to be addressed. It does, yeah. Um, but then, how can, how can, so how, how can you have, for me, in my, in my opinion, if if you're the best ever player that's ever ever played for Great Britain, in, in my opinion, in my opinion, and a lot of people's opinions, Ellery Hanley, how can you not have him involved somehow or somewhere? I mean, he's been out of sport for the best part of 15 years. He's an icon. He's, he is the game. Like, you know, he's the best, our best ever player. And you've got somebody that's of an ethnic, ethnic minority. How can we not have him, how can we not have him involved? From when I talk about breaking the cycle, so those players, Ellery, Roy Powell, um, Anderson Gill, they inspired Martin, inspired Jason. Jason inspires your generation. 100%. You've inspired Jermaine McGilvery. Jermaine McGilvery is top black player in our country. He's turned around on a call and says, disgusted at your treatment. When do you break that cycle? How do we break? When is someone going to put their hand up and say, well, actually, we're massively underrepresented. So, and I'm not saying people 
should get a job because of the colour of the skin. But if you want to inspire the next generation of young black players, you need to get people who they can identify with, relate to, feel like... I, I've never felt truly at home until I went to the Caribbean, to my dad's funeral. And I was surrounded by my family and I'm like, people look like me, I, I'll grow up in a white world. And, it, amazing, amazing. and people who, who've never experienced it don't understand it. And I don't expect them to understand it, just, just take my truth. There's so many lads who I've met, like me, who have been brought up by the man, normally who is white, who've, who've got that identity crisis, and, and it is a crisis, and there's so many yeah, good young players. Jason Robinson, prime example, do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, yeah. we're going back into the community, me and Jason doing some work through Jamaica with Chapel Town Cougars, and it's like, it's so important we do that because there's so many athletes out there, but unless we get, we break the cycle and get a Leon Price as on the sky regular, coach in England, not, not the England coach, Sean Wayne, amazing job, yeah, he's the man. But at a level, yeah. do you know what I mean? Just, but I think, not I think, just you, yeah, I think, whoever it is, I, Chev, whoever. I think, I think one, and I'm, this, this may go a little bit deep, you may want to quit out or have you, but we can talk about not, be, not having opportunities, but I'm going to touch on something that you just said then. And you said, um, your dad wanted in your life, Jason's yeah. dad wanted in his life, and a lot of yeah. black people like ourselves, yeah. mid-race people like ourselves, have not had their dads in their, in yeah. their lives. I've had my dad in my in my life. If it weren't for my dad, I wouldn't be sat here talking to you now. Yeah. My dad's my biggest inspiration, my you know, my biggest uh, guidance. So what we must do as people is make sure that we inspire our children and yeah. make sure that we're there for them. And I think if we can do that, that that becomes bigger than the game. Yeah. Is that we need we need to make sure that we're there for our children and that we we're there for them as a as a help. And I think that's bigger than the game for me. One man who did inspire uh, a generation of young black talent was Clive Sullivan, and he also brought the City of Hull together. Check this amazing feature out from Super League. Clive Sullivan broke barriers and bridged gaps. Now for Devon getting the pass into Clive Sullivan and a try, the first try of the match. He was the first black captain of a British national team. Everybody's saying go, 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 and he goes for a try to Sullivan. He won the World Cup. A boy from South Wales. He achieved fame in Hull. A Super League City with two teams. East and West. Red and White. And Black and White. He had such an impact on the city. The road that, that leads into Hull is named in his honour. In an era that was fraught with racial and social tension, Clive was a beacon of unity. A pioneer in the cultural history of British sport. He was fast. The crowd loved him. I've heard the rumours how Sully left people for dead, left them for dead. He was that quick, it was unbelievable. He was so exciting. And anybody with speed and who scores spectacular tries is almost revered by the many, and Clive was a gem. Clive Sullivan making it eight points to four. Clive Sullivan had been born in Cardiff and he was uh, of a generation of black rugby players who realised that they had to go north to fulfil their full potential. Many Welsh players realised that they wouldn't be able to play at the highest levels in rugby union because at that time it was an open secret that black players wouldn't play international rugby union for Wales. And Clive had seen the example of Roy Francis and particularly Billy Boston and he wanted to go and play rugby league. He knew that's where his future lay. And he was signed by Roy Francis at Hull. The, the, the original story of Clive Sullivan is that he was in the army the club rang the army, I think he was in Wales at the time, and um, a, 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 about him going for a trial. And Hull were playing badly that particular day, and I was captain of the team at the time. From, from the minute he, he touched the ball, he was electric, and, and he scored two blistering tries. He just zoomed, you know. But at half time, the, the chairman, our chairman, Mr. Ardecker, so Johnny, when the game finishes, for goodness sake, get hold of Clive and bring him straight into the boardroom. But by the time we'd finished, Mr. Addick had called me in the boardroom and, and said, we've signed Clive, we've signed him on a contract. And, and he, he just went from success to success. When Clive Sullivan was made captain of Great Britain in 1972, in hindsight, when we look back, I mean, this was a great historic moment. There's two things that are interesting. One, that in rugby league, this was just seen as natural. Nobody in rugby league said this is uh, unusual or this is unexpected. Everybody knew that Clive was a great man to do the job. 
and there, were, there was no discussion about the colour of his skin. Uh, he was accepted as the leader, and that's a very important point. On the other hand, in British society, there wasn't much notice taken of, the, or, of this. It, it wasn't seen as a great leap forward that it should have been in terms of integration. Like the one, and it was like the biggest thing I could imagine, and yet there was no, the papers didn't make anything of it. When they landed, there was no reception committee. And I remember he walked in and he had the World Cup in his hands, and then he went to work on the Monday. <laughs> It's a little bit like Vincent van Gogh, I think. Van Gogh painted a lot of pictures, and at the time, I think in his lifetime, he only sold one painting and probably died not realising how important it was, that he was a, a genius in many ways and so iconic. And you know, at the time, we probably didn't celebrate that enough. And certainly with 2020 and some of the political and cultural issues we've got going on at the minute, I think it only serves to highlight how important Clive Sullivan was in his journey and his achievements and ultimately the legacy that is left behind and we need to underline that, we need to frame that and tell the story because it's still got so much value uh, left to give. Sullivan! Ah! This is the try, innit? Can he go? I think Sullivan will go! Oh my word! Look at that sidestep as well. In now. They'll not catch him. See you later. Wow, <laughs> wow. You know, the, the knock-on effect or the legacy that he might have had would be to have encouraged other black players and um, multi-ethnic players to, to take up the sport. You know, um, having graced the field himself, I look at players like Desi Drummond and Ellery Hanley and Martin Afire and some of the guys that I watched Henderson Gill doing the boogie against the Aussies, certainly brings back memories of when I was a young kid and reasons why I wanted to pick up a rugby ball and, and go out and play but I'll say this again that you know it wasn't necessarily anything to do with their colours who were just great players. Growing up you want to be like them you know um, players like him you know as a winger as well being a winger myself you know I just wanted to emulate or get somewhere near as to how he was, you know, players like him, you know, they don't come along all the time, you know, and there's something special. Growing up in that era as well, it kind of been easy because I knew what it was like growing up in the 70s myself and the 80s, you know, you got a lot of stick as well, you know, from the general public as well and things like that. So it must have been very, very hard for them. And that's why I always say players like them paved the ways for players like me, myself, and all the others that came along after me. It's really inspiring what he's done on the field and also like off the field, how he carried himself. Obviously, back in his time, uh, things would have been worse, like with racism and that and racial tensions. And um, he's described as being a gentleman off the field also. Obviously, with him leading leading a team, leading the country, uh, you know, for in his sport and being the first black player to do that, I think obviously that inspired a lot of a lot of, a lot of black players that uh, were interested in, in wanting to get into rugby league or in any kind of sport. That, that that was the main thing, and knowing that he could achieve the goals that he wanted to achieve. You know, in our day, to some extent, we were illiterate to what the world was about. Really, you know, you know. Like we had Eastall and we had Westall and Westall was the fishing community and we were very, very tight knit. And um, so really the politics, politics in case of black and white never, never ever, in my opinion, because again in sport, when people are involved in sport by and large, you, you know, you, you're a team, you're a team outfit and it, it doesn't matter what, what you come from, you know, once you wear a, a shape, don't matter you're a millionaire or you're a pauper, you, you're a rugby player or whatever, isn't it? and so the same thing applies to black and white. And so in 1895, when the clubs broke away from the rugby union, it was over the question of the equal treatment of all players, that the Northern Club said, you shouldn't be disadvantaged if you work five days a week in a factory or down the mine. It's again based on equality, equality of opportunity, that the only thing that matters is how you perform on the pitch. It doesn't matter what school you went to, what university you went to, what job you do, what status is or what colour of your skin is. 
It's all down to equality of opportunity on the pitch. I think there's no bigger rivalry in rugby league. You know, all I've seen, all KR, the biggest rivalry, the biggest derby, many would argue. If you support one or the other growing up, you, you also grow up learning to wait at the other side. Um, and that's just, that's just how it is. Then, like I said, I, mean, I love playing for all KR now, and I love the fans, and I love this side of the city. But as a kid growing up as an FC fan, you get brought up black and white's the only way. You never wear red and white. You never support red and white. And that's just how it is. Because we live in the west of the city and Rovers are in the east of the city, the majority of people who lived around us were all FC supporters. Um, he got quite a few comments to start with. Um, there was an incident where they decided they would paint his car. <laughs> and when all came to all and we got down there, it was painted with tomato ketchup. <laughs> um, then it, it, it settled down. And um, since, since he's died, I think uh, the whole FC supporters were are still proud that he pay, played for them and broke records for them. He's well thought of across the city and Clive loved Hull coming from Cardiff and he loved the whole people, he got on with them really well. Um, very, very proud of being Welsh, but he was adopted by Hull. Whilst you look at it as rivalry and division, actually, Clive Sullivan Way brings them together. What an almost poetic way of doing it. He became part of, of the structure, of the infrastructure of, of the city, really. And, the, and it was easy for him to say, well, you know, let's name the road after Clive. He'd connected Eastall to Westall through his football skills and, 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 and also his persona. He's one of a few people that I think epitomises both sides of the city. He's been a fantastic ambassador um, for the city and, and for the sport of rugby league as well. And I think that, you know, when we lost him in, I think it was 85, you know, it was, it was, it was a massive dent for, for both sides, for both clubs on both sides of the city. And, and certainly for, for me personally, um, you know, I felt, I felt it um, quite a lot. It was, you know, it was like somebody had taken somebody away from you that, that you, at the time you probably want, didn't want to so as, as time goes by I think Clive will always be remembered for for the person that, that overcome the divide of the racism and the culture of, that, that he did you know he was he epitomized um, the modern day athlete yeah, in an age where diversity is so important that it's um, somebody like Clive who's the iconic picture, the symbol of pulling people together rather than separating them, keeping them apart. So it's, I think it's really special. Clive was my husband. He was dad to my two children, Anthony and Lisa. He was, he could be really good fun. Um, he, he had time for everyone. He was, he was modest and I, he would be amazed at the impact he has had, um, not only in Hull, sort of me sitting here today and speaking about him, it's 35 years since his death. He would be, he would be really, really amazed, as we are, you know, because to us he was Clive, he was my husband, he was Anthony and Lisa's dad. We haven't realised that. It's only now when I look back and, and read what he actually achieved. He achieved a lot in, in a short time. Absolutely outstanding uh, to see Clive Sullivan remembered so fondly by so many people. Price, it's, you know, we're getting towards the end now of Rugby M and it's great to finally have you on the show. Thanks for coming on and thanks for... Long overdue. For, for being so honest. Long overdue. Tough, tough, <laughs> tough talk, but I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad we had it. 
thanks very much for coming down tonight. We'll see you next week here on Free Sports. Keep it locked. A powerful show tonight. Thank you very much for tuning in, not just to tonight, but for the last eight years. Good night and God bless.